What interests me is questions which are scientific but uh, also philosophical. Origins of the universe, how the planets and the star form, origin of life, origin of conscious even. I was born in chalon sur saône and that's a small city in uh, Burgundy. Professor Jean-Louis Pouget, now 71, became interested in astronomy early on. My father, who had only an elementary education uh, to start with, bought many encyclopedia and one on astronomy. And so I looked very often at that one. I knew the, the name of the planets and their distance. The last year of high school, I was offered the admission in École Normale Supérieure uh, at Cachan. I did a master in theoretical physics at the University Paris Sud. One of my teachers, he developed a model with as much antimatter as matter uh, in the universe. And I said, oh, I want, I want to do that. He was given an internship to compute the ionization predicted by the model. Then he spent a few years working at the European Research Organization CERN and at the Goddard Space Flight Center in the US. I was very lucky at that time. Sean Lu obtained his PhD in France in 1973. He later joined the French National Center for Scientific Research, or CNRS. My work has been centered on what we call the cosmic background. The Hubble Space Telescope discovered the cosmic microwave background. The COBE satellite measured the spectrum of this radiation and uh, observed for the first time also its structure on relatively large scale. There have been two other satellites coming after, WMAP, still from NASA, which looked at that on smaller scales. And the third generation was a Planck that I led, which uh, did the same but with much better sensitivity. But before that, work on the detection of the cosmic infrared background. The red one is what we call far infrared radiation, which you cannot see, and which is radiated by objects which are much colder than stars. The blue part is the cosmic optical that we can see emitted by stars and the sun. Typically, as the same radiation. The red part was in the goal of COBE. It was exciting because we knew that the data uh, to make this discovery was, was available uh, with the COBE satellite. For a long time, only the people from the COBE team could work on it. And when the data became public, we found very quickly in a few months we were able to, to publish uh, and, uh, what we think was the tentative detection. My team detected for the first time the cosmic infrared background, which was uh, one of the uh, important discovery of my career. It was surprising that there was that basically half of the light of the, all the stars in the universe have been absorbed by dust at one time or another. It takes into account the very early galaxies. It's a very much more difficult problem to separate the galactic dust. The knowledge of the galactic dust by our team gave us an advantage on the people who had been trying to extract it before. In order to understand this cosmic infrared background, we were limited by the instrument at, at that time. And I got this idea with many others to say, well, it's, why don't we make a special measurement by adding the galaxies together? It worked nicely. And then I went to see Jean and said, yeah, yes, of course, go ahead. And then we publish it. And it was a great achievement to see that the galaxies creating the cosmic infrared background. jean louis is very humble. He lets people work their own and he doesn't steal their work. We had worked tracer of the dust in the best windows in the galaxy, uh, less are clouds of interstellar medium. Something which is more an interstellar problem, the yellow part, which is at mid infrared, and there were these uh, features which were known as the unidentified infrared uh, features. We didn't know the chemical species, nor the process. Sean Lu then led a small group to discover what turned out to be polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. At that time, there were three kinds of material known in the stellar medium. Ice, small silicate uh, grain, silicate is rocks, 
and graphitic material. Graphitic material is, is can be it's graphite, so it's in, in layers, and uh, uh, they had to be very small to be heated by single photons. So Alain went to look for spectroscopy of these things. Yes, and, uh, and we had a big surprise. And we had a very big surprise because uh, we had the idea that a small grain should be aromatics and with hydrogen, and it should be about 50 uh, carbon atom according to the temperature that they were uh, emitting. So we just look in the book and look for the biggest aromatic we find, and it was fantastic. We found line exactly where the observed line were. So it was a, really a shock. Nobody understood how it, they were produced and so on. So it, it was, so, oh! there is a quite a substantial amount of the starlight, which is re-radiated in that way. And, and furthermore, these very small particles are the ones which contribute to the heating, the interstellar gas. And uh, shortly after, I was able to confirm many of the ideas. Francois Boulanger worked with Jean Lou for over 30 years. I still remember it was a very exciting time and Jean-Luc Puget came to visit me and we were showing him the data and he was so impressed that he fainted. <laughs> yeah, he fainted on the floor. We had to, <laughs> we were very worried. When I was a PhD student, whenever he would talk to me, I was very happy if I could understand 10% of what he was telling me. He has not always a very organized speech and all when he writes also, it's apparently messy because he has so many ideas, he probably doesn't want to spend too much time organizing them because he's already thinking about something else. <laughs> but he's a very good collaborator, so I think always together with a lot of other people who help him put together what he has in mind. He was so enthusiastic and so uh, full of ideas that some people were kind of lost and I must admit that I was a bit lost in the beginning. He was also insisting very much on the uh, interplay between observing, modeling, that is building theories and constructing instruments has really been for me the main uh, lesson that I've taken from jean louis He's a really bad teacher. His class was not very, you know, nicely ordered, but we could definitely feel that he was a great scientific leader in a human way. In 1978, jean louis became deputy director of the Astrophysics Institute of Paris. Unlike many people who, who take bigger responsibilities tend to drive away from uh, the day-to-day -day work, but he, actually he's the most happy even today when he can actually be, be involved in the work. It's really incredible to find, find a person so enthusiastic on, 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 his, on his job still at his age. Usually when you get close to the retirement, you start doing uh, politics, and instead he's still uh, really enthusiastic about uh, everything, and every new findings, every new paper, everything uh, new is coming out. Coming up after the break, the Planck Project to uncover the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to the very recent galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So the impact is really huge. It gives a, a framework for all the rest of the cosmological uh, observations. An adoring family. Very proud of and uh, the dedication he shows. I'm just a bit sad I don't fully understand <laughs> the, the, the complex things he discovered. In the 1990s, Jean-Louis Puget led the creation of the Astrophysics Space Institute in Orsay, France. As director, he proposed building a satellite, spearheading the Planck mission. When we conceived Planck, it was to observe the cosmic microwave background, to observe its fluctuation. But of course, we wanted to remove the galactic part, so at the highest frequency, the dust, and at the lower frequencies, the cosmic ray electrons in the magnetic field of the galaxy. The project was accepted by the European Space Agency. Planck was thought to try and address, question, detect traces of a very, very, very early field, uh, which is called inflation, which 
basically gave birth to the universe. And in doing so, by building an instrument which is able to uh, detect radiation in different colors. This is a model of the Planck satellite, one fourth size. And so we can see here the telescope, the mirrors. So the, the microwave radiation bounces on this mirror, on this mirror, and goes to the HFI instrument here. This is the art of the uh, high frequency instrument. In fact, the bolometers uh, are here and they are cooled at a tenth of a degree above absolute zero. That what gives this extremely good sensitivity. And these two pieces are inside that, which was the, the HFI instrument itself. The radiation coming from the telescope are fed into the detection system through these cones. Three, two, one. In May 2009, the Planck satellite was launched on an Ariane 5. We put this satellite at a point which is 1.5 million kilometers, three times the moon orbit, on the line which goes from the sun to the Earth and outside. All this part was shielded from the sun by the solar panel, so everything, Earth, moon, and sun, was in the back here. And so that what made the possibility of cooling everything to such low temperatures. This is the clean room where various models of instruments were tested. What led us to propose Planck was uh, the fact that uh, a system to cool the detector at very low temperature, in zero gravity, was invented by a laboratory of low temperature physics. When I came to the IES team he was heading, I to him telling, OK, I think it's possible to make a new kind of instrument that will be about a thousand times more sensitive than the Kobe satellite. It took one week to reflect for him, and he told, OK, one week for such a decision that was the 25 years of our scientific activities. He's a very intent scientist, uh, and uh, he essentially never let, let it go, <laughs> which I think is probably what it takes to go through a project over such a long duration. The first concept of the instrument came in uh, 1993 and we were able to test the different models in the years 2000 to 2005, 2007. The flight model was tested for only three and a half months, working 24 hours a day. We have to test the response of the receivers to the photon flux traveling for 13 billion years. Just when the universe was at its first beginning, only old uh, 300,000 years. This is the final product of Planck. The map, after removing the low and high frequency foregrounds, the map of the anisotropies. Planck uh, allows to, to, to constrain cosmological parameters with uh, basically percent accuracy that before was not, was not possible. It's much, much easier to explain. It helps also all the theory of the star formation. Now we know that we have 70% of the energy in the universe, thanks to Planck. That is called dark energy. It explains that the universe is accelerating. So it's become bigger and bigger. That uh, breaks through uh, uh, progress in, uh, in cosmology because it gives a, a framework for all the rest of the cosmological uh, observations done with a big telescope on the ground or in space. Planck, our CMB so far, is the only probe we have had for humans that is capable of constraining together all the basic elements that determine the evolution of the universe. It's probably a thousand people from academic laboratories and universities which were contributing to Planck. And then there was industry building the satellite. Total cost of the Planck mission is half a billion euros. It's among the expensive in space instruments. What is great with the work from Rui, he works with a lot of people in such a way that he knows with who he has to interact to, get, uh, to, to solve problems. We had 50 detectors in HFI, which was very small. 
And now uh, they have experiments on the ground which have several tens of thousands of detectors. And I guess uh, in 10 years there would be probably hundreds of thousands of detectors. A new international mission is proposed for 2028. Measuring the polarization and measuring spectral distortions of the cosmic radiation based on a completely different instrumental setup. The search for life somewhere else is a big topic for future astronomy to test if there is sign of biological type of chemistry which would basically sign the presence of life. He's driven by the quest to understand the universe. He's really a kind of person that is really simple. We love to travel abroad, hiking and sailing. With my parents and when we were at high school with my brother, we were sailing on very small sailing boats on the river Saône, where we lived. Then we got taught about how to sail along the coast and navigate. That's great. In 1978, Jean-Lou met Catherine from Brittany on a sailing trip. Very uh, rough and sportive because we were 10 people on a wooden boat of 10 meters long. No facilities and no motor, only sail. So it was very fantastic. When you first met him, what did you think about him? It was ugly and <laughs> not very good speaking and not very well. <laughs> there were other people, and it was maybe it was the best one. There were uh, several women, for example, on this sailing boat, but uh, obviously I was much more attracted to, to Catherine than to any of the other. We started dating, was just was after, because meeting, showing photographs. We used to travel once or twice a year in uh, foreign countries, in rural areas, with interesting people. She made very nice photographs. We lived together without being married during a long time. Until their elder son, Jeremy, was 15 years old. The day we got married, he went, he went to high school. And <laughs> but why did you suddenly decide to marry? It was mostly practical. Catherine, an economics major, has retired after working as a journalist for the newspaper Liberation for 20 years. We love our work. I chose not to go abroad to uh, my job, to stay in Paris in order to take care of my children because jean was traveling a lot. I'm proud of what you achieved. Seeing him uh, work uh, all this time for decades, uh, every evening, every weekend, on his uh, vacation, <laughs> on a boat, lost in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, still working on his, <laughs> his papers. On holidays, for instance, I hear him a lot um, talking uh, during conference calls and struggling to explain scientific concepts and not really understanding, but he always manages when we're on holidays to find times for all of us, uh, despite his jobs. Uh, there was one vacation just before they would basically pack the satellite. I was on the beach and they told me that there had been a, a, a leak of helium and that was an extremely serious problem. Each evening, <laughs> I have a um, recipe of the day, but the difficulty is that he supposes that I have a PhD, <laughs> but I am not a scientist, I, have a, I am an economist. Very proud of the dedication, he showed a very good uh, achievement. <laughs> He's very manual, so he teached us a lot on uh, how to repair things. Yeah, it was not only spiritual uh, stuff, it was also uh, a lot of uh, how to live. We had a house in the south, south of France, and uh, basically he, uh, we had a telescope there. We looked at the stars. We knew most of the uh, constellations when we were 10. It's hard to follow the same path as, you, <laughs> as your father. We are both engineers. I'm more into the, the uh, statistical 
um, plus uh, artificial intelligence. I am uh, working for an uh, information system. You must be proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. We use this moment all together because it was all, always there, like um, Planck and the results of Planck. And so that was really you exciting. Think he's a smart guy. Yeah, I'm so impressed. <laughs> We're very grateful to have them close by. He's a, a great father, a great grandfather. He's nice and uh, we play with him. I was preoccupied about doing, you know, family and I wanted children very much. So I didn't feel it should be in competition with my work. I am formally retired from CNRS, but I am in the Academy of Science. I still have plans in my work, but the uh, pressure will, will go down, so it will be easier to take more time, especially for the children, for the grandchildren. A question pondered since the ancient Greeks. Answered in the 20th century. If a woman develops breast cancer, are her sisters and daughters more likely to develop the disease than a woman, the sisters and daughters of a woman who stays healthy? The answer was yes. I began working on the problem in 1974. As a postdoc in the University of California in San Francisco, Chicago-born Mary Claire King had majored in mathematics at Carleton College, but switched to genetics in graduate studies at UC Berkeley. I took a genetics course, and it was so fabulous because it was implicitly quantitative. Genetics is a way of thinking. If I can state a problem clearly, there are in genomics sets of tools that can address that problem. Her PhD thesis analyzed comparative proteins to show chimpanzees and humans are almost 99% genetically identical. I understood how to make arguments about species similarity, both mathematically and at the level of comparing proteins or comparing DNA. Cancer seems to me to always be genetic. But the question I asked is, is it ever true that predisposition to breast cancer could be passed from one generation to another. Mary Claire selected 1,500 families with women diagnosed with breast cancer. What kind of patterns would we expect for breast cancer in the sisters and mothers of these patients? I made some mathematical models. Was it due to some shared environmental exposure? Was it due to chance? Or was it due to some inherited genetic predisposition? When we had good mathematical evidence, it was necessary to find the critical genes. It was thought that cancer was too complex to be able to be linked to a single gene. She really kind of fought against the entire scientific world sort of scoffing at that idea. Through the 1980s, King's Laboratory studied families like this one. The black circles show women with cancer, clear circles with no cancer, squares are men, and lines through circles or squares mean the people have died. Ultimately, we were able to identify a section of chromosome 17 that was co-inherited with breast cancer in the family. This is the paper that really called the breakthrough. That was my whole group at the time. 1990, we published in Science, and it made a big splash. Many groups all over the world began to compete to try to identify exactly what the sequence of the gene was. Another group, not Mary Claire's, identified the original sequence of the gene. It was named BRCA1. That group tried to patent it. Finally, our Supreme Court said, you can't patent a part of the body. So that was very good because that enabled that enabled testing to be very widespread. We were able to determine what specific base pair had gone bad in this family to lead to this predisposition. It's the change in amino acid number 61. And those proteins interact in such a way that 
DNA is repaired properly and that estrogen is processed properly. But they can't function properly when a devastating mutation happens. Every person has two copies of this BRCA1 gene, which is on chromosome 17, and which has lots and lots and lots of junk DNA. It's highly repetitive. If one is unlucky and has the other copy of BRCA1 with this inherited mutation in a cell of the breast epithelium, or if it happens in epithelial shell around the ovary, they proliferate. Pretty soon, a whole tumor has developed. In this family, all of the women who have a, a mutation in BRCA1 that they've inherited from either a mother or a father in the family are now extremely vulnerable to developing breast or ovarian cancer. One of the women in this family decided in her 40s to surgically remove her breasts and ovary. She's now alive in her 80s. It's an absolutely drastic thing to do. One would never consider it, except in these circumstances of extremely high risk. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of families of all possible ancestries, and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of different mutations in BRCA1 and in its sister genes. Dr. King is a professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, USA. Dr. King is an unusual and truly outstanding scientist. We were very fortunate that uh, she joined our uh, Division of Medical Genetics in 1995. She was professor of genetics and epidemiology at UC Berkeley from 1976 to 95. But Berkeley didn't have a medical school. When my work became more and more related to health and to cancer, I needed to be able to work with medical people. She insisted that uh, I needed to recruit all of the students in her laboratory or she wouldn't come. A team is like a family. Only one of her original 13-member team remains, Chinese scientist Ming Li. She wants to use her scientific knowledge and her capability to help people who are disadvantaged and who may be at risk of uh, suffering from diseases for the breast cancer gene. We spend countless hours and days, weekends and evenings, looking over the data and searching through family records. We were determined that we would solve the problem. She's incredibly careful and incredibly um, detail-oriented um, and very principled. Every little progress was perceived as, as if it was a big discovery. In another study, Mary Claire looked for BRCA mutations in perfectly healthy middle-aged men. In families where the index man had had a BRCA1 mutation, the chance that one of his female relatives who had the same mutation would develop either breast or ovarian cancer by age, say, 70, is about 80%. It's extremely high. For a family with a BRCA2 mutation, the chance that a, that a female relative would develop breast or ovarian cancer by age 70 is about, what, 65%. So the risks are extremely high. International guidelines now suggest that a woman who has a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation when she's about age 40 or when she's finished having her children have the ovaries and fallopian tubes removed and that she also consider having the prophylactic mastectomy. Dr. King also found about half of the women who have BRCA mutations have no family history to indicate them. She carried a mutation in the gene, inherited from her father, who's remained healthy, and he's from a small family. So we've been able to encourage the idea that all women, regardless of their family history, be offered the opportunity to have BRCA1 and BRCA2 sequenced when a woman is about 30 or so. On average, in America, a woman has about a 1% chance of carrying a mutation. The fact that we can now connect uh, specific genes to the cancer allows development of approaches to treatment that are based on the specific genomics of the individual patient's cancer. There are now drugs called PAP inhibitors. They work in concert with conventional good platinum chemotherapy. There is no reason for any woman with a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 mutation to die of breast or ovarian cancer. 
and it's within our power as a community to make sure that that information is available to women. Probably hundreds of thousands of women's lives have been saved. She continues to enroll um, families in our research study. There are still a lot of families that have clusters of breast cancer not explained by BRCA1 or 2 and other breast cancer genes that have been identified. She's traveling um, nationally or internationally to uh, give talks or support other groups. I'm trying to identify young people who have developed schizophrenia in families that are completely healthy. Our hypothesis for those families is that a new mutation has occurred during gestation. Mary Claire also worked in Israel and Palestine. To identify the genes responsible for congenital disorders of newborns that, that are particularly common in communities that are consanguineous and to try to develop treatments around them. Mary Claire began in 1984 to work with the grandmothers of Conquista de Mayo in Argentina to help them find children kidnapped during a military dictatorship. We developed a, a particularly powerful approach called mitochondrial DNA sequencing that's now used worldwide and enabled us to uh, identify many children. Mary Claire has one daughter. She lives outside of Berkeley. She went to Brown. She works in animal rescue. She leads a very green life, a very ecologically sound life. To use genetics in creative ways. It's been tremendous fun. I hope to continue to work in genetics as long as my brains are good. Computer simulation has developed new fields, but partial differential equations have been, up to now, what people use to describe phenomena from our daily life. Membrane elasticity, fluid flow, insulation, base pricing. There is a universality of these problems, and, and so it is nice because it is a a constant challenge. I was raised in a very modest family in Argentina. His dad had studied technical design. The sign signature says Luis Caffarelli. He did it when he was 22. My father, in some sense, was, uh, from when I was a kid, proposed me nice problems. I went to uh, high school. The team is very selective and you have to pass exams. Lewis studied maths at the prestigious University of Buenos Aires. Mathematics will accept some of the basic course in physics. Physics was very beautiful, but it had a touch of non being serious enough. Mathematics is black and white, <laughs> you know, or you prove it or you don't prove it. Obtaining his PhD in maths and harmonic analysis, Caffarelli got a fellowship in 1973 to go to the University of Minnesota in the US. There was very top people doing partial differential equations at that time. He took a course on harmonic functions given by a retired professor. It was a beautiful course and I asked him for some problems and he gave me something that he has done on the obstacle problem. I started from scratch and I became fascinated. He soon began producing major papers on the obstacle problem, which became one of his main contributions to maths. He applies an old equation, the Laplacian. So you have a domain, right? And you have a little hill, right? and you want to spend the least money in covering it. When the membrane doesn't touch the obstacle, the Laplacian of you is zero. And when it touches here, it's bending down. So the Laplacian of you is negative. What I prove is that the solution is smooth when it separates smoothly, and that this curve is a smooth curve is the minimum of all the super solutions. He has unusual intuition. He could take ideas and put them together in a way that no one would think about. You have a balloon and you 
push it, right? Then if the surface below is not a plane, right? Then you can have parts which are a nice shape, but then you have what is called singularities, a bunch of little points. What can you say about the singularities? I didn't know what to do until like 15 years later, I was flying to, uh, to Japan, right? And I realized I could apply another formula. Another obstacle problem is free boundary, such as the Stefan problem, the melting of a solid. This is like a container. Here I have ice and here I have water. I start to hit this place, so the temperature of the water will rise and start melting the ice. The surface is evolving, right, pushing the ice away. So you have the law that says that the speed with which the uh, water advances is proportional to the slope of the temperature. So for the Stefan problem, you would like to see this nice surface which moves with the velocity that satisfies this law. That's what the end of my theory. And my thing is problems that have phase transition, which are given in a non-clear way, really can be realized in a nice mathematical way. This phased transition solution can also be applied to optimal insulation. Your home, T equal to one. You are giving here the, the set of insulation material that you can spread around here that have this volume. What you want to optimize is the, the flow of heat towards the boundary. That means you have to minimize the temperature on this surface. That would be the solution of the optimization problem. Another of Caffarelli's obstacle problems is integral diffusion, such as salt going through a cell membrane. This is an integral diffusion along the surface. Uh, Prove that the contact sets have a nice uh, separation, a higher regularity of the solution, and uh, so then became a big theory about fractional Laplacian problems. Fractional PDEs is a very hot subject these days. Louis is an authority on the subject and published a number of papers that had, has, uh, have had a, a tremendous impact. A lot of my papers have been about filling the gap between what you can build just by general uh, considerations and you would like to see. I had a great time in Minnesota. Over a decade there, he rose to become full professor. In 1980, Lewis joined the Courant Institute in New York University, where he collaborated on the Navier-Stokes model. The Navier-Stokes equation describes the flow of an incompressible liquid, like water would be, but that has viscosity. You have a particle that is flowing at this velocity and suppose that the surrounding particles go at a smaller velocity then that will break the speed. We show that if the solution of Navier-Stokes equation happens to have singularities, these singularities cannot cover even a curve in space and time. So that means that basically you will never see them. Navier Stokes is uh, using numerical simulations all over the world thousands of times a day. Luis works help us to ensure that the numerical uh, solutions that we get are actually meaningful representations of reality. Many of the fundamental models of the universe were put forth by scientists and some of these models were completely wrong. Luis Caffarelli has been instrumental in making sure that the models of physics are on rigorous mathematical grounds. In the late 1990s, Lewis considered an offer from the University of Texas in Austin. We looked up in the sky, and there was a Halley comet, and I told Lewis, that's a sign. It means you should come to Texas, and he did. The department has 55 tenure faculty. This is the spirit head. We're extremely proud of Lewis, one of the best mathematicians in our lifetime.
He's one of our, um, you know, one of our, our dearest uh, colleagues who, uh, who helps us all in many, in many ways. Famous mathematicians are not very approachable. With Louis, he's a very, very nice person, always ready to talk to you, even if you come uh, with stupid questions. Our students love him. He's a good teacher. Louis's wife, Irena, is in the faculty of the university's Institute of Computational Engineering and Sciences. They made us a very appealing package. Irena's work is related to statistical mechanics and numerical analysis. What yeah, he does yeah. is very hard, very unique, very innovative. What yeah. you are doing is as complex and as hard. He and uh, his wife, Helena, has made this place really like a family. They have a very good environment for the younger generation of mathematicians. I had uh, many postdocs and I share ideas with all of them and they collaborate among them, so I'm glad of having created this community of people. He brings them into his house with Irina, both of them, and they have many, many social events, dinners. Irena also studied maths in the Buenos Aires University. He was well known in Buenos Aires and was doing a, a, a spectacular career. In 1982, Irena went to Minnesota for her PhD. That's where we met again. And we were yeah. sort of, yeah, I guess you can tell it. <laughs> the couple married after Luz briefly joined the University of Chicago in the 1980s. They have Alejandro from Luz's previous marriage, and Irena gave birth to two more sons while she completed her PhD studies. He is an he, he, he still are, but he has been, when they were babies, an extraordinary father. I may be home taking care of the children, they were okay, I will sit on a table and do some work, help them to have free time to work. The couple took turns commuting for a few years after Lewis joined the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton in 1986, and Irena's fellowships took her to Indiana and New York. Luis would take me every morning to the train station, and then you would drop Nico in daycare, and then it was the nursery school, mm -hmm. and he would come and pick me up at 6.30. Luis has a large family back in Argentina. We still have a strong emotional connection with all of them. I will uh, spend long parts of the year <laughs> there when I retire. Hot summers, I will go and spend them in Mar del Plata by the sea. And of course, also, I will spend good chunks with my children, which are spread, so I will go. Alejandro is a lawyer, Nico a molecular biologist, and Moro a medical doctor. Would you ever retire? Well, I guess, yeah. <laughs> I'll take the life as it comes. Even if I retire, if I can still chat mathematics with young people, I'll keep doing it. If at some moment my mind is not much for that, then I'll slowly stop.